I am here to introduce our next panel, AI Goes to Hollywood 2024, the second in a series of looks at how AI is impacting the media, entertainment, uh, and artistry industry. Um, I'd like to introduce the moderator of today's panel, the extraordinary Matthew Bellany. Matt is a founding partner of Puck, the digital uh, online publication that has taken the US by storm. He's waiting in the wings. <laughs> and um, Matt is uh, also really the go-to source for business, entertainment, and political news. And Puck, I think, is even expanding into other verticals. He is here today to lead this conversation after having had a busy year as a journalist covering the entertainment industry at one of its uh, most challenging times. Please welcome to the stage Matthew Bellany and his panel, Duncan Crabtree Ireland, Lisa Takuchi Cullen, Lindsay Doherty, Matthew Loeb, and Meredith Steam. All right. Welcome, everyone, to our AI Goes to Hollywood panel. I'm just going to do little brief intros of everyone so we uh, make sure we know who everyone is. This guy to my right is Duncan Crabtree Ireland, who you know. He is the National Executive Director and Chief Negotiator for SAG-AFTRA. He was the lead negotiator with um, SAG's president, Fran Drescher, of the most recent collective bargaining agreement with the studios that uh, ended what was the day? When, when, did you, when did you ratify? Oh, December 5th. December 5th, okay. D-Day. <clears throat> um, and to his right is Matthew Loeb, who is the uh, international president of the International Alliance of Theater Stage Employees. I never get the IATC acronym correct, so. Theatrical Stage Employees. I screwed that up. Uh, one of the largest labor unions in North America with over 170,000 members working behind the scenes, creating magic, and keeping everything running smoothly in our favorite theater, TV, movie, and sports programs. Okay, then we have our writers' leaders. We have Meredith Steam, who is the president of the Writers Guild of America West. She is an award-winning writer and executive producer of hit shows including Homeland, one of my favorites of all time, The Bridge, and Cold Case. She's been a Guild member for three decades and a fierce advocate for writers, and she helped achieve their groundbreaking 2023 contract. Then we have, yeah, applause, <laughs> perfectly fine. <laughs> then we have Lisa Takuchi Cullen, who is the president of the WGA East. She is a seasoned TV writer, author, and journalist. She previous, previously served as the Guild's vice president of film, TV, streaming, and played an integral role in bringing the new contract across the finish line. She's also the first person of color to serve as WGA E president. And last but not least is Lindsay Doherty. She is director of the Teamsters Motion Picture Division and Western Region Vice President. That's a long title. Um, she is a proud second generation Teamster from Detroit, Michigan, and has been fighting and winning on behalf of the rank and file members of Local 399 for the past decade. Okay, so that is our great panel today. <clears throat> um, and before we, before we look forward, I, I do want to look back a little bit uh, at such a tumultuous and um, ultimately uh, meaningful year in the labor movement in Hollywood, specifically when it comes to AI. So if, if Duncan, if you and the, the women from the Writers Guild could just summarize for everyone here what the specific gains were in this contract when it comes to AI, from your perspective? Sure, and I think our perspectives might be slightly different on this, so, so I think it's great to get that question, and thanks for asking it, Matt. Uh, for us, I think the core issue was always about informed consent and fair compensation as it relates to any kind of use of artificial intelligence. And, you know, it may be shocking, but there was nothing in our collective bargaining agreement to really ensure those principles were respected. And, the prior panel, D said it's so important to make sure that you, you know, have evolutionary language so that it can deal with that kind of transformation. And for us, it was establishing and enshrining this philosophy in our contract language because we believe if you embed the concept of fully informed consent, give people control and agency over the use of that type of technology, 
and you embed the concept of fair compensation, then that can automatically evolve with changes in the technology. And so that's what we fought for, and it took from day one of negotiations on June 7th to day 118 of the strike. It was one of the first issues on the table on the first day, and it was the last issue uh, completed on the very last day of our strike. And why and, do you think yeah. it was the last issue resolved? Because it was the hardest, in a lot of ways, it was the hardest issue. There were a lot of hard issues. Breaking the pattern is another one. But this one was so hard, I think, because these companies really didn't want to agree to anything. And they didn't want to agree to anything for two reasons. One being, they don't actually know what they want to do or what they are doing. I mean, I would point out, in, I think it was March, a colleague of mine, Jorge Gere, was here, and I went and made a presentation to 30 executives of one of the studios about AI basically telling them, helping teach them about AI prior to our negotiation. They didn't, I don't think they knew what they wanted to do. And number two, they are super scared of what other tech companies who aren't part of this entertainment community or part of these collective bargaining agreements might do to compete with them. So I think that's why they fought it so, so hard, but they did fight it so, so hard, and it was the very last thing to get, to get closed in this negotiation. And we'll get to that, what these deals can impact in terms of other companies. But let's talk to the, the writers here. What do you see as the big gains from this new deal? So for the writers, the very basic uh, language that we got was that a writer had to be a human, which seems very simplistic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but it was very important because we saw... Know, another world that looked terrible to us, which was that they could do an AI-generated script, give it to us and say, hey, just do a polish, which would make us not paid the way we need to be paid, and credited the way we need to be credited, et cetera. So that was the big thing. We also got transparency, which um, means that if the studios are using AI in any material that they give to us, they have to disclose that. And we also got the right to not use AI if we don't want to, if writers don't want to. So those are our three kind of pillars of what we got. So AI cannot create source material. That's kind of the basics. So you can't have a script that's by a robot, right? It has to be by a human. But as with SAG-AFTRA, the studios absolutely didn't want to talk about this. And even though AI was new, this was not new in terms of technology because in 2007, 2008, we had the exact same deal with the internet where we said, hey, the internet's coming around. This is before streaming, right? We said, we think it's going to change things. And the studios said, well, wait a minute. We don't really know what it's going to be. And it was the same story this time around. AI, we don't really know. It, I actually went back into my notes from the negotiations to find what exactly their chief negotiator, Carol Lombardini, said to us about AI. And oh, she this said, will be good. Oh, yeah. We don't want to preempt technology that we might be able to take advantage of. Was her actual line no, to that's us. That's honest. Right? And it is. I mean, that was the reason yeah. AI was last on the table for us, too, is, and why they didn't even respond to our proposal for five months. We went on strike without them ever having acknowledged our proposal on AI. So that signaled to us they really wanted to use AI. But it's not a total ban. And the studios do have room to negotiate uh, in both of your deals. But in the, in the writer's context, the studios do still have the ability to use scripts in language learning models. Is that my understanding? Is that correct? Where they can use existing scripts to create AI-generated scripts. The thing we did not get is training, that we were that we were not able to get them to agree to not use our material to train their own AI right. systems. So that, yes, that was something we didn't get and something we're sort of reserving our rights to have legal action on later. But that we would have liked to have gotten that. And with, our, with the studios, we negotiate with them and we have a deal with them, but they are as worried as we are about companies like OpenAI and ChatGPT that we don't have contracts with. Right. And they are basically scraping the internet for our material and repurposing it and monetizing it without our permission or compensation or credit. So that's actually an issue that both sides um, are very worried well, about. And that's interesting. I'll get to the other unions in a moment. But I want to get to this issue in which you are aligned with the studios. How much in these conversations did it come up where you could have said, listen, why aren't we both suing these companies? Why aren't we together working to stop 
these non-signatory companies from benefiting from our work. Duncan is smiling. Well, no, I'm smiling only because it's, a, it's, again, a different situation for writers versus actors because of copyright law mm -hmm. issues we don't necessarily need to delve into. But I would just say, we, I mean, really, we are. And uh, I mean, that's why we have the No Fakes Act, uh, which is a piece of legislation that's pending in Congress right now to grant federal rights for image likeness, voice performance for individuals that don't exist now. And yeah, it's not the lawsuit because we're not, in the case of actors, generally there's not a copyright interest, but we're 100% supporting those, those litigation efforts. And we strongly believe that training of AI systems should only be done with appropriate authorization from copyright holders and also from, in the case of performers, anyone whose image, voice, likeness, or performance is being used. And we're absolutely fighting for that on the public policy side. But the writers do have a, not a copyright interest, but they do have an interest in, in this material and it would be an interesting lawsuit if writers were to team up with the studios. Has there been any movement on that? So I'll tell you, the night before we finally made a deal, I think it was September 27th, it was the last issue, and it was getting kind of contentious. And at this point, it was just the leadership and the CEOs. And this one issue was, um, was sitting there. And it was, became clear none of us really understood what could happen. And it also became clear that they were divided. The legacy companies were much less interested in using AI than Amazon or Apple, which are really sure. tech companies. Makes sense. So they were not even on the same page on their end. But the thing that kind of brought us back together from the brink we worried was that we had this shared interest. That we writers don't have copyrights on, on screenplays or on television scripts the studios own the copyright. So actually, it's their material that's getting scraped and stolen, basically, for uh, these, um, these language models. So there is this weird coming of minds that I think got us over the contentious part of, are we walking away right now? Or are we going to get over this? So we, th there wasn't a direct conversation about, like, hey, do you want to go in on a lawsuit together? Right. <laughs> but it was, you know, we understood that we weren't completely unaligned. OK. All right, so let's go to Matthew and Lindsay, because I feel like in 2024, all eyes are on you two. And I want I wanted to hear from you about how you believe the deals that were struck in 2023 are impacting your negotiations in 2024. Thank you. Um, first of all, I also, and I know it's said twice, but I also need to thank the uh, great IATSC employees who are making this happen. I do so to avoid no shit moment <laughs> as their president. So thank you all for your work. Uh, look, I mean, I think Duncan just touched on it. You know, th there are differences in the, in the various trades and crafts, uh, but certainly the studios are on notice that this is a, a crucial uh, issue for us, uh, and we're going to fight very hard. We have in our union, scores of categories um, on any job. We have 13 unions in Hollywood just to make a picture. So we have a lot of layers of um, craft-specific issues we have to look at. Give us at. a couple of your specific well, I mean, issues. We, we run, you know, painters and carpenters and set dressers to editors and camera people and sound people and technical crafts. And so there, you know, probably is um, prioritizing to be done. But if you look at each of those individually, they have their own um, risks, I think. So, you know, we're going to look closely at the deals that uh, were already made. And, and I think that uh, if we can draw from some of that, we should, since the studios are familiar with it and uh, agreed to it. But I think we have a, you know, we have a pretty uphill climb as far as making sure that those folks are safe. Uh, and that they're secure and protected. And, and as far as I'm concerned, and I did go walk, uh, walk the floor this morning, and you hear them all say, you know, this is something that it takes 10 people to do now, but one person could do it after AI. So we're almost an afterthought, and we um, have never been able to get in the way of technology. That's not how we view this fight. Um, we have uh, bargained for it, over the years and gotten the jurisdiction uh, for most of the changes in technology. But this is happening already. It's in motion, it's moving, they're doing it without us and they will find a way 
to try to go around us. And so I think that, you know, getting ahead of it and, and these fights that the guilds had last year um, paved the way for us um, and, and the studios are, are on notice. When I talk to people around Hollywood, and I've even said this myself, given the pain of a six-month shutdown in 2023, there's a lot of people who have said, well, the industry can't really withstand another strike. What do you think when you hear that? The companies can't withstand <laughs> another strike. Let's be clear on that. Especially Paramount. <laughs> but I, I can, we can bet on one thing, that the companies have not learned from their mistakes that they made with the Writers Guild and with SAG-AFTRA. We're seeing it now when we're negotiating Teamster contracts across the country because it's not just Local 399 that has an agreement. We as Teamsters have been battling um, you know, our members being replaced with technology throughout the years. The truck itself used to be a wagon, and our general president in the early 1900s saw that the motorized combustion engine was going to be invented, and we captured that work with, with across the entire country, which strengthened the Teamsters during that time. So we've been battling GPS tracking devices and things like that, and right now it's autonomous vehicles because that's the AI that our driver members are seeing right before them. And anytime you say AI or anything like that, the studios, they don't want to talk about it, like Meredith said. And that's really concerning because this is an actual reality that's happening right now. I had a company to say today, there's no way someone's going to get in a vehicle without a driver. And it's happening in California right now, which is with the robo taxis we've seen Unroll, they, they rolled them out in San Francisco earlier last year and then in October in Los Angeles. And they're there right now offering free rides without a driver. So it is a reality. And to hear, you know, the companies during the negotiations of SAG and WJ say that, oh, they're seeing ghosts. No, these ghosts are real and we have to have the discussion. But that's what they're really going to have to sit down with the Teamsters and IATSE and talk this through and not just say no because we're not going to settle for that. But just to be clear, you are prepared to strike if you guys can't get the deal you want. Nothing's off the table. And we're not going to give up our strength and our ability because they think they sacked us because everybody's bank account got sapped because they were unreasonable for months and months. Mm -hmm. And my, my folks aren't going to just settle. Um, you know, the last contract we bargained, uh, you know, was coming, coming, you know, the COVID situation was there. It was unique. Um, Folks are fed up, you know, and I don't know what to call it if it's a post-COVID wake of dissatisfaction, but people are ready to fight, um, and, and the studios would be uh, ill-advised to assume that they've weakened us to the point where we can't. And, and Matt, can I just add, yep. and I, I feel confident that Meredith and Lisa will agree with this as well, the support, unity and solidarity from IATSE, from the Teamsters and others during the very difficult year that we had last year, you know, we will be there standing side by side with IATSE and with the Teamsters, whatever it takes to make sure that you get fair contracts from these people too. And maybe they will, Lindsay, to your point, maybe they will eventually learn the lesson. Let's hope so, because we are united. This, this, the labor community in Hollywood is united like it has never been, at least in the 23 years I've worked at SAG-AFTRA. And that is absolutely how it should be. And that's how we're gonna keep it. Um, no matter what happens in next in this year's now negotiations with IATSE and the Teamsters. I would just say the support of the three other unions up here was a game changer for the writers. Bef even before the actors went on strike, they were out there with us. These guys were out there with us. The Teamsters were turning away from sets and shutting down production. It was amazing, and we are going to be right there for them when they need us. I don't, I don't know, can I, if I could just jump in about that, um, because I think it's really important uh, that everybody here who doesn't work in the entertainment industry knows that the strikes uh, of the Writers Guild and of the Actors Guild were successful because of the Teamsters and IATSC. Because of them. They, they stood by us, and when we picketed outside of productions, Teamsters refused to cross a picket line, even if it was only two people which is what it, what it takes, right? Two people to make a picket. 
At 2 a.m. outside Silvergate Studios in Queens, they refuse to cross our picket lines. And so that's, why, that's the whole reason I'm here. You might be wondering, why are two WGA presidents here? I flew all the way from New York, where they're having a weather apocalypse, by the way. I flew here expressly to show that the Writers Guild solidarity with the Teamsters and with IATSC runs from coast to coast. So, so just practically speaking, if there is a... Practically speaking, if there is a... Uh, IATSE or Teamster Strike. That means pencils up for writers? We don't know what it means. We don't know what it means, so I'll, I'll just be honest with you there. Mm -hmm. Well, we know that we're not allowed to do that. We tried to get that in our contract in the end. We, we but add, that's tough, right? Because you don't have it in your contract. You are not supposed to not contract. be able to do that. Yet. It, it, it's okay, though. They can keep writing, because that shit's going to be shut down anyway if IATSE and Teamsters are showing up to work. I will say... And, and I, mean, I, think I would that's, say that's before we took that off the table, we, that was one of our, you know, we wanted the right to have, what the Teamsters have the right to not cross picket lines. And before we took that off the table, we did ask Lindsay if that was okay because we wanted her support in that because we didn't want to take it off. But, uh, but an individual can decide to put pencils down if they but want. And, but and just to that point, I mean, during the writer's strike, during the writer's strike, the industry was shut down as well. I mean, we have a no-strike clause. I'm pretty sure IATSE has a no-strike clause too. And yet... During the writer's strike, the industry was completely shut down in essence. So, you know, I think that the fact is the solidarity really has an impact. It was proved during the pandemic when we all worked together to make sure that the return to work agreements were done in a way that made sense to the industry, and it's been proved ever since. And without a camera, it's radio. <laughs> <laughs> or, yeah. um, I want to get a little bit into the negotiation strategies here because... One of the other panelists previously talked about not having the language be static and getting language that can evolve. And I wonder, from your perspective, the writers and the, and the actors, when you were negotiating this language, how much did you fear what you were doing would quickly be obsolete? Or did you discuss hypotheticals and tease it out with the other side to try to make it as broad as possible. Like, take us through that a little bit, because this is all evolving so quickly, and the fear is that when you get around to your next negotiation, everything that was accomplished is going to be moot. Well, if those philosophies are embedded in the language that you've created, then that is what's gonna actually continue forward, because informed consent, in, in our example, informed consent and fair compensation are concepts and principles that will always be needed and yes, you may have to evolve the language. I mean, just this morning, SAG, after we announced at a press event here at CES, a, a deal that we've just entered into with Replica Studios, which is an AI company that's creating digital voice replicas for use in the video game industry. And that agreement itself in, is, is, is even evolved from the language that we just negotiated in the TV theatrical agreement with the major studios. And our goal, of course, is to continue evolving this language, continue setting new standards with employers proving to the industry that real major employers who are on the cutting edge of this business can make ethical, fair, responsible agreements with talent, and that frankly, talent is only gonna work with companies who do that. And that's the message that we're sending. And so yeah, in two and a half years, there's gonna be an evolution of the language that's in the TV theatrical agreement. But you know, one of the things that's in there is a right to meet, and I think the Writers Guild has this too, a right to meet with those companies, in our case, uh, twice a year, to find out exactly what they're doing with AI and especially generative AI so that we are well informed and prepared for that next evolution of that language. Is that your approach as well? Hmm. We have a long history with the AMPTP and do contracts with them every three years and they're very tricky with language we've found. The, uh, you know, a verbal deal doesn't make sense for us because they do things in the in the contract language that is not what we said. So we have mm -hmm. very uh, tuned in lawyers and negotiators at the Guild who are so aware of the, how important the language is, which is why it's so clear and simple. A writer must be a human, you know, that there's no, you know, fudging that. So, um, you know, we certainly stopped the bleeding in many areas, but also AI, but we're laying groundwork for our next negotiation, which at this point is only two years away. And there are things we didn't get that we're gonna wanna reapproach. There was, your, there was, an, entire, oh, there was an entire day where we argued about whether the, the language should be AI or GAI. Do you remember that? 
it was, you know, whether it should be generative AI, which the studios, they wanted to narrow the scope. So in, at every turn, they were trying to narrow the scope of what we were, what we were able to, to uh, get in the language. Um, so I think D is absolutely right. It can't be static, and it has to be as broad as possible to allow for those possibilities. Oh, did you have some? I, I can just say that, like, technology is going to, for us, it, it, the goal for the employers is to cut their costs, and that's going to always be on the backs of our members. So this is a provision that this fight is never going to end. So this is just like working conditions or increasing wages and benefits, it's always gonna be a discussion every contract cycle. We just know that because of the way technology is evolving right now. Meredith, is there one thing that you're looking forward to in the next negotiation to address first when it comes to AI? Well, it's like the internet in 2007. We didn't quite know what was coming, right? We They said, oh, it's experimental. There's not really gonna be any profit on TV and internet, <laughs> right? And then half of our work now is streaming the internet. So we don't know um, what we don't know, but we want to be prepared for as things evolve in the next two years to figure out where we need to uh, fill the gaps and you know stop the bleeding there. Um, but the question mark, it's all evolving, you know, and we, we don't know everything. How about you, Duncan? First priority. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think over the next two, two and a half years, we're going to get a lot more clarity in terms of the intellectual property rights in the material that's been scraped and that will be scraped for training data for GAI systems. So depending on how that plays out, I have a feeling that um, addressing the training of GAI systems will be an important topic. It may or may not be the top priority. We'll have to see. But I think certainly we're very focused on on the potential implications of generative AI, because we really haven't seen them yet. We've seen a lot of digital replication using other types of AI technology, but uh, the real impact of generative AI in terms of performers is yet to be seen. Lindsay, when we were talking before the panel, you mentioned that legislative actions are even more important or a higher priority than even these individual contract negotiations. Can you explain why, and can you give us sort of a state of play right now in different legislative pushes. Given the increase in support nationwide for the labor movement over the past five to seven years, you would think that the legislative push would be a little easier than it may have been in the past, but I don't know if that's the case. Well, you can certainly tell a lot about a politician about how they feel about labor when they veto a bill um, like Gavin Newsom did for the Teamsters. We had an assembly, Bill 316, that we put forth last year in the state of California that required a human safety operator, which is also known as a truck driver, for an autonomous vehicle over 10,001 pounds. So that's a semi-truck. And overwhelmingly, the legislator voted that this should be required, and then Gavin Newsom vetoed the bill. And that's very telling because he's beholden to the tech companies. And really, when you ask somebody, you want a semi-truck just driving down the street? Like, it's, it's common sense. It's not just a, a worker issue, but it's also a safety issue. So for the Teamsters, that was one of our agendas last year internationally to put forth this legislation in the, in the 50 states. And now we're actually reintroducing another bill um, this week in California that's going to be even more, um, you know, rigorous uh, against what Gavin Newsom probably wants in the state. But this is something that you know, for us as Teamsters, for truck drivers, because we do have a lot of truck drivers, not just in Hollywood, but also nationwide, that's a priority. But I think the lack of transparency is very telling, not just with the tech companies. And that's an issue. There's very little regulation around this. And there's a lot of politicians that know very little about it. So there's a lot of these conversations that need to continue to happen so people are educated so that we can get regulation that's going to prevent them not just from displacing workers, but also from destroying our communities. Has there been a victory, a legislative victory that you can cite lately? No, because California was going to be the one, but I guess it's not. <laughs> uh, Newsom well, also vetoed the right to get unemployment during a strike. Newsom should consider himself this last term, and he's done. Really? Well, unless he runs for president. According to the Teamsters, we're not going to support him. And if you look at the federal level, obviously, you know, there was the White House executive order on artificial intelligence. That was, I think, really important. It, for the first time, really acknowledged the role of the Department of Labor in actually helping to lead the federal government's response to AI. And then there was a series of panels um, in the Senate sponsored by Majority Leader Schumer. I know Meredith participated in one. I participated in one. Maybe others did, too. 
But one of the things I thought was so interesting is in the panel that I was on, uh, there was actually consensus amongst all sides, the, the AI companies, the, industry, the entertainment industry companies, and us and labor about the need for this federal bill, the No Fakes Act, which provides this uh, image, likeness, voice, performance protection. And then at the very last second, the MPA tried to slide and say, but actually there should be an exception for internal use, you know, for training, because this, what this is gonna do is this is gonna help control the use of image and likeness and, and voice and performance in AI training as well because of the nature of the legislation. And it was just so telling that, that even, even the industry companies will support this idea as a general rule, but want an exception to this rule for their own internal use. So we have to be vigilant all the time, and even in areas where there's a developing consensus on a public policy level, we have to be just on it every minute to make sure that what comes out of that you know, sausage-making process is something that actually results in the benefit that we're fighting for. Can I bring up also, in, in New York State, uh, there is a bill to amend the New York State film and tax, uh, uh, film and TV tax credit uh, to disqualify you from receiving those credits if you use AI in production to replace human jobs. Um, so there are a lot of ways to skin the cat, and uh, I think you know state legislation is also really important. Now. Where is that now? Uh, it is being debated. Yeah. Um, Lisa, staying with you in a moment. The WGA East also represents a number of journalists, a number of media organizations have their, their employees represented. Uh, it, it's been this sort of odd situation. I use the New York Times as an example, heavily unionized, heavily uh, organized under, under WGA East, yet the New York Times just hired someone to run their AI initiative. At the same time, the New York Times is suing ChatGPT. Where does the guild fall in this equation, and who are you supposed to root for in these situations? The New York Times is not in our guild. Oh, they are. It aren't. is in the news guild. Oh, yes. okay. So uh, pardon, pardon my mistake. Yeah, no, that's fine. Um, so the WGA East, unlike the WGA West, also organizes journalists, um, including broadcast news writers and uh, some digital, we call them online media journalists. And we are laser focused on AI because, as you know, that is a, a scourge in journalism right now where we have, you know, venerable institutions like Sports Illustrated publishing fake articles with fake writers, including fake bios. They, they use like stock photos to show, you know, Bob Smith wrote this article. So the, the danger is very much present right now in journalism. And what we've been able to win is, uh, for instance, for a, one of our shops, a Financial Times Specialist, uh, they have to come to the union first before they, the, before they institute use of, the, of new technologies. And for another one of our shops, uh, Future, uh, we got a clause in their contract to forbid the company from replacing humans with technology. So it's possible. We have 16 open contracts in 2024, and we're going to argue for AI in every single one of them. Yeah, you know, Matt, I, sometimes people forget that SAG after also represents broadcast journalists. Oh, I remember. And, uh, <laughs> but, but, you know, I, and I think that, that there's an additional twist on that. We, uh, like the WGA East, we're very focused on how to protect our broadcast journalists in radio and television and online uh, from, you know, the implications of AI. But there's also a really important transparency piece that relates to sort of civil society and the public, which is the reliability and authenticity of news because as people who care about our country and care about what's going on, it is really problematic when AI tools can be used to deep fake trusted voices and use them in ways that they would never have approved or intended. I mean, I, you know, this has always been something I felt strongly about. I experienced this myself during our ratification campaign. Someone created a deep fake video of me uh, advocating against the ratification of our contract, which obviously was not how I felt oh, I haven't in my seen position. That. And you know, it, uh, it's one thing to talk about it from a policy point of view, it's another thing to actually experience it happen and hear someone using what sounds like your voice saying things that are the opposite of what you believe. So this is really important, I think, for everyone uh, in the labor movement and beyond because when trusted voices for things like news and policy information become readily faked, it undermines confidence in our whole political system and the ability to actually ensure that our government is working correctly. So this has huge implications, not only from a labor perspective, but also just from a public policy and good government perspective. Yeah, someone sent me a Matt Bellany column written by ChatGPT. It was not bad, it was not bad. Uh, all right, we're gonna open it up to a, a question or two from the audience. There's one raising your phone there. 
Okay, if you could come over to the mic. I'll ask a question, even though I didn't have my phone raised. Oh, I thought um, I saw a phone there. So. So, Name and local number. <laughs> <laughs> Bran O'Hearn, IATSE, local 762. Um, so I'm curious what the panel thinks about the importance of organizing to combat the uh, infiltration of this new technology into our crafts, and also the ability to organize outside of your traditional jurisdictions things that you can foresee taking jobs that are within your traditional jurisdiction. Yeah, the impact on the non-signatories, as we call them. Well, I mean, the first thing that I would just say is, and it was referenced earlier, this is one of the reasons why things like what the, the AFL-CIO's initiative with Microsoft is so crucial, because that is, first of all, an amazing accomplishment, as we've acknowledged, but second of all, it's really primarily directed, from my point of view, at organizing and making sure that you know, Microsoft and the companies that are part of Microsoft, which has a web far bigger than most of us even think about, are in a position to at least be neutral, if not, you know, supportive of workers' rights to choose the right to organize. And, you know, we've, we've been fighting this battle on a public policy level for so long to get a big, a huge company like Microsoft on board with that. I think hopefully we'll start a trend in that direction because absolutely we need to make sure that we are organizing and expanding units to make sure that as work may change, as a result of the implementation of new technology that we can't stop, we are continuing to represent those workers and making sure that that's done in a way that is human-centered. And it, it's so easy, and like I think somebody mentioned it, go and walk around this, this, around CES. A lot of people here don't think about the implications of the technology that they're developing. Um, and, you know, they, it, if they are held accountable by us, a lot of these technologies can be implemented in an ethical, responsible, and human-centered way. But it, you know, these are human decisions that are, humans are making this decision. Randy is worried about the future where AI is making this decision, but to, that is not today. Today, humans make those decisions, and if we hold them accountable and make sure they make the right decision, we can actually change the future, and we have to know that so that we don't let that opportunity pass. But, but I've heard this from many people, that the, the first fully AI narrative feature that catches on with consumers will likely come from a non-signatory, a company outside traditional entertainment. How do you deal with that? Well, you have to organize in that situation. I mean, organizing has traditionally, for us, been the antidote to all of our issues, right? You have a unified labor force and you have a resulting power. But I think the issue here has to do with shifting the work to some extent so that, you know, we have to protect the jobs of the people who've made careers that are in them now. And they may not be the same people in 25 years who are doing that work. And that, you know, w will require um, organizing. But I think one thing that's really important uh, for all of us as the labor movement is that we hammer home the value of work and dignity at work and having jobs. And, and being part of the success of it. And so, you know, if we can make, you know, AI in, in, into tools that enhance our work or there are benefits that flow down, and of course, you know, normally that doesn't happen. Normally it's, you know, it's lopped off at the top for the rich. Um, and, and we just have to keep telling uh, the employers and government and anybody who will listen uh, that we're not going to stand by and watch people you know, be put on the street who have put uh, their hearts and their lives into their work and that there's value in all work. Tom Cruise, sag after member. So uh, let's go to one, one more question over here. Uh, hi, uh, Richard Chavzin, sag after Chicago Local. Um, for our colleagues in the Writers Guild, the Teamsters, <clears throat> and the IA, how, we've been talking about this, this conversation has been in the context of uh, uh, prevention and, and preventative measures for job protections. But has there been in your worlds already a loss of jobs due to either AI directly or technology? And what steps did you or are you taking to either uh, retrain or save those positions? 
You know, AI is so new that it was a projected fear more than something that was happening in the moment, as far as we knew, right? We don't know exactly what the studios are up to, but it was so interesting because we started talking about our proposals in February, March, and AI was like number 36, you know, and as time went on and ChatGBT became bigger and bigger, it got big, it became our number one issue it, by the time we went on strike and finally made a deal. Um, so it was the projection of what could happen for us and, and that we had a lot of safeguards in our contract that we hope has blocked most of that. Um, if I may, I'm still thinking about a question a little bit earlier um, when Duncan mentioned the, the AI conversation that Chuck Schumer had. Um, I was there and Liz was there and Randy was there. And all these kind of tech bros were there, right? Like Elon Musk was there and Mark Zuckerberg and Sam Altman. And there seemed to be this, this sort of like, I'm an ethical person and we would never let this do anything bad. And, you know, but we got to go. The only way to test this is to put, you know, put your foot on the gas and go. And it, I think the thing I fear the most is self-regulation that you know, Schumer sort of ended it by saying, well, clearly we need policy on this, which I couldn't agree with more. But there seemed to be this sort of misplaced trust that these companies would regulate themselves. And I think that is the fox guarding the hen house. And I really think government has to do it. We have to, you know, lawsuits have to do it. It isn't just within our contracts, because organizing is what we do best. We're doing that. But um, I am worried about this idea of nothing being done or self-regulation being considered enough. One, do we have one, time for one more? One more question? I thought I saw right, him. Right here. Right here. Oh, right there. Yep. So uh, actually, on that front, uh, one of my favorite movies is The Hunt for Red October. And at the very end, the guy goes, you arrogant ass, you've killed us, right? Because they launched the torpedo and blew their own sub up. A lot of the guys, those tech bros, are those arrogant asses who have killed themselves sometimes, their own exec jobs, wait till the first AI run fund runs like a Wall Street fund and beats everyone, right? The question I have about, first of all, I just wanna say as a member of SAG after local LA, I am so grateful to all our sister unions who stood with us and we stood with you and it was very moving for us to all be on the same page. The most important question I think that faces us as we make these contractual gains in these present moments, there's always the naysaying of, but what about my panicked issue, right? How do we keep our members and our groups working together on what is the situation now in the immediate three-year future, two-year future, whatever our contracts are? How do we calm the sense of overall panic that the whole world is falling apart, which I understand it can be real and sometimes is exaggerated operationally in the immediate now? And how do we get that feeling, which is starting to grow, it was here last year, that it's not inevitable that we'll all be obviated, that we are part of our workplaces and part of our work being done. I think we just have to keep that alive. How do we keep that alive while we do have to make compromise? We do have to take things off the table. I, it's an important question, I think, as we move from contract to contract in a highly evolving thing. Thanks. Well, first of all, we can't stop talking about this. Obviously, it's still continuing these conversations, but I think we've learned throughout time if we're not having these discussions, we don't know each other's issues. Now, going back to the gentleman from Chicago about his question about CG, CGI specifically impacted our members. This was 20 years ago. Animal trainers were replaced with CGI because they were able to produce animals through CGI and not use our it, members. It still never looks quite right, but it continue. Looks, <laughs> so strange and terrible. Um, but I think, you know, that's where we have to, this is not going to go away ever. And look, it, we have to be very clear, we're not against progress. And I've said this to you before in our recent discussions, because we're not. We, we use technology for our jobs and we have to be open-minded, but also we have to resist when it's going to impact our members and them losing their jobs. So that's where we have to just continue to have these conversations. And I can't you know, speak to the, the panic that is all the time for some people, but I think it's, we're in a different place than last year. I think SAG and WJ really started this you know, discussion with AI where it wasn't really 
happening in Hollywood, and now it's very much happening in Hollywood, and I don't think it's going to go away anytime soon. So AI is a great unifier. That's what we found uh, in our strikes. I mean, the percentage of the tens of, I don't know, hundreds of thousands of articles that were written about our two strikes, like what percentage of them, of them had AI in the headline, right? I mean, the number of picket signs that were about AI, on certainly for the Writers Guild, like chat GPT doesn't have childhood trauma. That was a favorite. There were so many. And if you look around, even though our strikes have ended months ago, there are still dozens of articles coming out every day about how AI is going to replace workers. And I think that that is a drum that we keep beating, right? Not a lot of people really understand AI, but everybody fears it to some extent. Some people are excited about it, but everybody fears for their jobs. It's incredibly short-sighted on the part of some of these tech bro leaders because like, if there are no workers earning incomes, who's gonna buy your iPhones, right? Who's gonna buy your Ford Tauruses? We, we need money in order to do that. They need to sustain the economy and not replace human workers. But I do think that AI itself as a topic will continue to unify workers going forward. Yeah, it's interesting. So I have a slightly different take on it, Lisa, maybe from a slightly different experience set, because I think AI is a natural unifier for people saying no to AI. But I think it actually takes a lot of courage for union leaders to really recognize that sometimes the perfect is the enemy of the good, and that if you, if you say no to everything, you end up in a situation where you have made it, you know, a lot of valid points pushing back on things, but you haven't actually changed the direction that the industry is moving in. And that's something the Writers Guild accomplished, and I think SAG AFTRA accomplished. But you know, in the end, we had to have a very intense discussion during our ratification period with our members, because there are some members who would have preferred that we somehow just block AI completely, stop AI from happening, et cetera. And the reality is that if you want to actually make sure that this is moving in the right direction, that we're building a human-centered approach to AI, it takes incredibly courageous leaders who are willing to say, this is the priority, not this. This is how we're gonna strategize and achieve that result. Because you don't get to that result, certainly not in collective bargaining, and I don't think in public policy either, by just saying no to everything. You have to find that path that actually can, can bring a deal home that provides you the protection that you need. And that, that required great courage on the part of our leadership, and uh, I'm really proud of them for that because it was, not, it was not easy to bring that home in the end, even though in the end we had a great result with 80% of our members ratifying the deal. Nonetheless, that was after a very intense conversation about about the issues around AI and that conversation definitely continues. Meredith will kick my ass if I don't follow up by saying the Writers Guild actually did that too, where we went to our studio employers and we didn't say we're gonna ban AI, we said that we just need some guardrails. And I believe that that was the blueprint going forward, at least that's what a lot of the press said too, for a lot of labor unions uh, in order to, to uh, get um, some approval from uh, the, the, our negotiating. All right, well, I wanna thank this great panel. This was really interesting. Thank you to everyone. Thanks to everyone here, too.